This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Murder Methods, Mass Murder. In today's episode, I'll discuss a case that occurred in 1966 that was shocking and horrific in nature. Not since 1949, when Howard Unruh took his walk of death, that I detailed in the last episode, had the nation seen a multiple murder of this caliber. This is Chapter 2, Richard Speck and the Crime of the Century. This episode is brought to you by me and my Patreon supporters. Thanks to all of you for your support. Become a patron today and get free and discounted merchandise, early release episodes, bonus episodes, and more. Just go to patreon.com slash once upon a crime to sign up. That's Patreon P A T R E O N dot com slash once upon a crime. Thanks so so much. July fourteenth, nineteen sixty six, South Side Chicago. On East one hundred Street sat three townhouses where nursing students who worked at South Chicago Community Hospital resided. During the first two years of their schooling, the student nurses were required to live in dorms attached to the hospital. The last two years, however, they were allowed to live off campus in one of the three townhouses. Eight student nurses shared the two-story, three-bedroom homes. That morning, Judy Dykton woke up early to get a little more time to study for an upcoming exam. By 5.30 a.m., she was headed down to the basement to do a load of laundry. On her way back upstairs, she heard a noise, like the whimper of a small animal or a child. Looking out of the window, she saw a woman standing on the street and looking up at the window of 2319, the building directly across the street and a match set to her own building. Judy looked up at the window and saw a young woman crouched on the window ledge crying, Oh my God, they're all dead. Judy grabbed her robe and ran across the street and through the front door of 2319. Immediately upon entering, she saw a nude woman lying face down on the living room sofa. Her hands were tied behind her back, and a knotted strip of cloth was tied around her neck. Judy ran to get the house mother, yelling, There's trouble in 19. She ran back to the young woman she'd seen on the ledge. Judy now found her standing halfway down the stairs. Later, it would be discovered that the woman was too terrified to leave the house and had instead screamed and yelled for help for several minutes until Judy had heard her and come to her aid. The woman now yelled to Judy, Don't come in. He might get you. He might still be in the house. Judy went to her and put her arms around her and led her down the stairs and into her own house. The police had been called by the house mother. What they would find when they arrived would be a horrible sight they would never forget. The first policeman on the scene was a rookie officer, Daniel Kelly. Walking into 2319 East 100th Street, Kelly saw the body of a young woman on the sofa. In a weird twist of fate, Kelly recognized her. She was Gloria Davy. Officer Kelly had known Davy growing up and had even dated her older sister Charlene for a while. Soon other officers and investigators arrived to secure the scene. They found eight females in total. Davy was the only person found on the first floor. The other seven were found in various locations upstairs. As Judy had observed, Gloria Davy, 22 years old, was found lying face down on the living room sofa. She was nude and her hands were tied tightly behind her back with strips from her own blouse. A strip of sheet was tied tightly around her neck and knotted at the back. Davy, it was surmised, had been carried down the stairs before she was attacked. Pieces of her blouse and buttons from it were found lying in the stairwell as if the attacker had begun ripping the clothes off her as he transported her downstairs. Davy had been raped. A white men's BVD t-shirt was found next to the body on the floor of the living room. Later, investigators would also find another of the same type of t-shirt wrapped up inside Davy's underwear and slacks that were found upstairs. Upstairs were three bedrooms. In the northeast bedroom, they would find three bodies. Pamela Wilkening, age 20, was found lying on her back with her hands tied tightly behind her. There was a gag in her mouth, and she had been stabbed once directly in the heart. Lying next to her, face down, was Suzanne Ferris, age 21. A white nurse's stocking was tied around her neck 
and double-knotted at the back. She had 18 stab wounds in her back and neck. She had a strip of bed sheet wrapped loosely around her wrists. Next to Suzanne was her friend Marianne Jordan, age 21. Marianne was on her back, a piece of bed sheet clutched in her right hand. She had been stabbed three times in the chest, once in the left eye, and once in the neck. In the northwest bedroom, three more bodies were found. Nina Jo Schmally, 23, was lying on her bed, her wrists tied behind her back, her face covered with a pillow. A strip of bed sheet was tied around her neck and tied into two knots in the back. Her nightgown had been pulled up and she was nude underneath. She had superficial stab wounds to her neck. On the floor lay Valentina Passion, 24. She was lying on her stomach. Her hands were unbound. She had been slashed in the throat from ear to ear and was nearly decapitated. On top of Valentina, lying across her body, was Merlita Gargullo, 23. She was face up, her wrists and ankles were tied. She had a strip of bed sheet tied around her neck, and there were four deep stab wounds to her neck as well. The two girls had been stacked together, and a bed quilt had been thrown over their bodies. Finally, in the bathroom, Patricia Matuzik, 20, was found lying on her back on the floor. Her hands were tied behind her, and she had also had a strip of bed sheet tied tightly around her neck. She was partially undressed. Eight of the women were residents of 2319. Gloria Davy, Suzanne Ferris, Patricia Matuzik, Nina Schmali, Pamela Wilkening, Corazon Amaral, Merlita Gargulla, and Valentina Passion. Corazon, or Cora, Merlita, and Valentina were from the Philippines. They had come to work in Chicago and had moved into the townhouse just three months prior. Marianne Jordan was the only one of the victims who did not live at the townhouse. She lived at home, but would often come to visit her friend Suzanne. Of the eight residents, only Cora was alive. Now the police and investigators needed to find out who could have committed such a horrible crime, and they needed to find out fast. They believed that a group of savage murderers was walking the streets of Chicago. They needed to get information from the only living witness, Corazon Amaral. The story she would tell would surprise and astound them. The nurses who'd been on duty that day returned home around 4 p.m. The three Filipino girls made dinner and ate together at about 4.30 and then headed upstairs. Tired after being on their feet all day, they all went up to their beds to nap. They woke around 6 p.m. Valentina watched TV in the living room. Merlita sat at a downstairs desk to write a letter home, and Cora hand-washed her uniform in the upstairs bathroom. The American girls drifted in and out. Suzanne and Marianne left to visit a friend, and Gloria Davy left for a date. At about 10.30 p.m., Cora locked the front door and went upstairs to prepare for bed. Valentina, Pamela, and Pat were already in bed in the larger back bedroom. Merlita had gone upstairs as well and was lying on the bottom bunk in the room she shared with Cora. Cora locked the bedroom door and turned out the light. At 11 p.m., Cora heard a knock at her bedroom door. It was just a regular knock, she recalled. As she began to open the door, it was pushed in with some force. Cora was five foot two and weighed only 95 pounds. Now in front of her was a man named Richard Speck, who was six foot one inches tall and weighed 160 pounds. He was wearing all black, his short sandy colored hair was combed straight back, and his face was pockmarked. In his hand, she saw a small black gun. Where are your comrades, he demanded, grabbing her arm. Merlita now got out of bed, and at gunpoint, the man led the two women down the hall to the large bedroom in the back of the house. Inside, three women were sleeping. He turned on the light. He motioned with the gun for the women to sit on the floor. He then turned off the light. What do you want, one of the girls asked Speck. I need money to go to New Orleans, he answered. We're going to give you some money, Pamela said. Speck began to talk to them in a low voice. He had a southern drawl, and he smiled at them as he talked. He seemed gentle, not threatening, except for the gun that was constantly pointed at them. Finally, he asked, how much money do you have? Each woman answered, five dollars, or four dollars, or whatever they had to give. Pat pointed up and said, it's on my bed. She grabbed her purse and gave him the money. In turn, each girl in the room retrieved her purse and handed him her money. When it was Nina's turn, she told him it was in the other room. He had the six women stand and marched them down the hallway to the second bedroom. 
Afterwards, he brought them all back to the big room. They sat waiting to see what would happen next. Now that he had their money, he would surely leave. At 11.40 p.m., Gloria Davy returned home from her date with her fiancé, Robert Stern. They sat outside for a few minutes, listening to the car radio, before Gloria kissed him goodbye. There was a 12.30 a.m. curfew for the girls, and Gloria didn't want to be late. She had been drinking champagne that evening and felt a little tipsy. As each girl arrived home, she was required to call the house mother in the next building to check in. Gloria did so now, and when Speck heard her on the phone, he tiptoed from the door to look out of the window, and then back to the door. When Gloria put her hand on the knob and began to open the bedroom door, Speck yanked it open. Gloria screamed. He quickly stuck the gun into her side and motioned for her to sit on the floor with the other women. He asked Gloria for her money, which he then shoved into his pants pocket with all the other money he'd taken from the women. For the next few minutes, Speck spoke softly to the women, telling them not to be afraid he wasn't going to hurt them. He sat on the floor with them and casually smoked a cigarette. He smiled and tried to joke with the women, but they remained too terrified to respond. All of a sudden, he stood up and grabbed a sheet off of a bed. He took out a knife and began to cut the sheet into strips that he then draped around his neck. Cora said it was the first time she realized that he also had a knife. He then squatted next to Pam Wilkening and began tying her ankles together with the sheet. He then asked her politely to turn around. He bound her wrists. He kept the gun on the floor close to him as he worked. Her wrists were tied with the backs of her hands placed together, making it impossible for her to untie them. He also used tight double knots on each binding. After he was done tying up Pam, he crawled over to Gloria and began tying her the same way. He wanted her to turn away from the window and face him, but she was tied so tightly she could not. So instead, he picked her up and placed her on the bottom bunk bed. He then moved to each woman, tying them up in turn, all the while talking to them reassuringly and telling them he wasn't going to hurt them. All the while, however, he also kept clicking the gun, revolving the cylinder from chamber to chamber. By 12.15 a.m., all the women were bound. Speck went over to Pamela Wilkening, untied her ankles, and pulled her up to her feet. He placed the gun in her back and walked her out of the room. About a minute later, the women left in the large room heard a small exhale come from Pamela. They heard nothing after that. Speck had stuck a cloth in her mouth and tied a strip of bedsheet around her head to secure it. Now that he had her completely helpless on the floor, he was intent on raping her. Back in the room, the women began to debate what to do. Cora said that she and the other two Filipino women wanted to fight, scream, or push a lamp out of the back window, anything to call attention to what was happening. Cora, having been raised in a rough neighborhood in the Philippines, said that she knew a dangerous criminal when she saw one. She urged the other girls to fight, but the American girls said they should remain calm and not antagonize the man. They felt that their training on how to deal with unruly hospital patients should be put to use now. If they remained calm, they were sure he would not hurt them as he had promised. Unable to agree, they remained silent and waited to see what the man would do next. At 12.30 a.m., Speck had been in the house for over 90 minutes. Suzanne Ferris was still out. Unknown to Speck, she had entered the house at 11.30, 30 minutes after he'd arrived. As he was in the process of rounding up the girls, Suzanne had snuck in to call the house mother before quickly heading out again. She was at her friend Pat McCarthy's in the townhouse at 2315. Also with them was Suzanne's friend, Marianne Jordan, who'd come to visit. Now Suzanne and Marianne went together to 2319. Marianne was not supposed to be visiting after curfew, so they snuck in quietly as not to arouse the house mother next door. As they burst into the bedroom, they saw Pam bound and gagged with Speck above her. He turned to them, startled, and they tried to run, but he quickly blocked the stairs. They then ran to the back bedroom, where they were shocked to see all the other women also tied up. Speck caught up with them and forced them back to the bedroom where Pam lay helpless. At this point, Suzanne and Marianne had a good reason to try and fight their attacker. Unlike the other girls, they had seen what he was doing to Pam and knew what could be in store for them as well. Cora said that they heard a yell and noises that seemed to indicate a fight or a struggle. Suzanne and Marianne were trying to fight their attacker, but he quickly overpowered them. Suzanne's hands were found with a strip of sheet tied loosely around them. 
as if he had begun trying to bind her before she tried to fight him off. At that point, he must have taken out the knife. Suzanne was stabbed repeatedly before he strangled her with the stocking. Marianne was stabbed in the face before he plunged the knife into her chest three times. After they were no longer a threat, he turned back to Pamela, killing her by stabbing her in the heart. The next sound the six remaining women heard was water running in the bathroom. Speck was washing the blood from his hands. He didn't want the other girls to panic. They wouldn't know until it was their turn that he was killing them one by one. He'd also planned ahead, bringing several white t-shirts with him so that he could change out of one bloody shirt before re-entering the bedroom for his next victim. The rest of his clothing was black and would hide the blood stains. The next woman he retrieved from the room was Nina Schmally. Again, they only heard a soft exhale before all was quiet. He had taken Nina to the second small bedroom where he'd placed her on the bed and covered her head with a pillow. He spent a full 20 minutes in the room with Nina before returning to the remaining nurses. While he was gone, the other women had tried to hide. All except Gloria Davy had changed positions in the room. Gloria, having drunk several glasses of champagne that evening, had a blood alcohol level that was half of the legal limit at the time, much higher than it is today, and had fallen fast asleep on the bunk where Speck had placed her. Pat Matuzic had crawled between the two bunk beds and was lying on her stomach. Valentina and Merlita, both very petite women, inched their way to the wall on the far side of the bunk. They also lay flat on their stomachs. Cora, the smallest of the women, had turned on her side and then rocked herself back and forth on her stomach to wedge herself under the bed on the opposite side of the room. She was able to get her body under, but try as she might, she could not get her head underneath. He next came for Valentina. She was taken out and only a small gasp came from the other room. Twenty minutes passed before they heard the water running in the bathroom once more. Valentina, it would be determined later, had fought her attacker, scratching him in the chest as she tried to ward him off. He cut her throat, nearly decapitating her. He then returned, and not bothering to untie the tiny Merlita, he picked her up and took her out of the room. She was strangled and stabbed in the neck. Speck took 30 minutes to make sure his sixth victim was dead, before once more returning to the bathroom to wash the blood from his hands. He then closed the door where the three dead women lay. Speck returned for Pat Matuzic, asking her, Are you the girl in the yellow dress? Later, it would be determined that Speck had been watching the house for at least three days. Just down the street from the townhouse was the National Maritime Union Hall. He had visited the Union Hall on several occasions in the past few weeks to try and get an assignment on a ship. But more often, he had been frequenting the bars around the Union Hall. Two days before he intruded into the nurse's townhouse, he had passed by and seen Nina Schmally, who was wearing a yellow-colored nightgown at the back door. Pamela Wilkening was being picked up by another couple and a blind date, and Nina had gone to the back door briefly to get a look at Pam's date. At trial, the prosecutor would state that Speck had scoped out the home with the pretty nurses ahead of time. However, he had mistaken Pat for Nina. He took Pat into the bathroom and Cora heard him say, Lie down here. He said it again louder. Pat must have refused to comply because Speck kicked her viciously in the stomach, causing her to hemorrhage. She was then strangled. While Speck spent over 30 minutes in the bathroom with Pat, Cora was able to conceal her entire body under the bunk. It was about 2.30 a.m. now. Speck re-entered the large bedroom and sat down next to Gloria Jean Davy, who was still sleeping on the bunk. Cora heard the door slam loudly, which awakened Gloria. Cora peeked out from her hiding place and saw Speck removing Gloria's pants. She heard Speck raping Gloria. A few minutes later, there was silence. She then dared to look once more and saw that Speck and Gloria were gone from the room. Cora took this opportunity to try and conceal herself further. She slowly and with great effort was able to crawl out from under the bunk. She then rocked herself from side to side until she reached the double bunk on the opposite wall. She wedged herself under the bunk and as far to the wall as possible. A blanket hung over the side of the bed, concealing her further. Speck was gone for over 50 minutes, the longest amount of time yet. He returned at about 3.30 a.m. He had carried Gloria downstairs, ripping off the rest of her clothes as he went. He'd placed her on the living room sofa and raped her again before strangling her. 
Gloria was the only woman who, it seems, Speck was able to complete the act of rape upon. Later, he would say that Gloria reminded him of his ex-wife, a woman he'd beaten violently and would accuse of cheating on him when he was in prison. Cora, terrified, held her breath and prayed she wouldn't make a sound. Speck turned on the light this time, and she was sure he was looking for her. Instead, he picked up Gloria's purse, shook out some coins, and threw the purse across the room. He then turned out the light and walked out of the room, leaving the door open. He walked downstairs and out the front door, leaving that open as well. Cora stayed in her hiding place until the first alarm clock went off at 5 a.m. Too terrified to go downstairs, believing he might still be in the house, she crawled out of the window and began to scream from the ledge until she was heard by Judy Dykton across the street. Later, it would be surmised that Speck knew that eight girls lived in the townhouse. There were eight murdered girls in total, but one of the girls, Marianne Jordan, was not a resident. Speck, believing he'd killed all eight, miscounted, and so Cora became the only survivor. The first investigators on the scene believed that more than one person had to be involved in the murders. They didn't think one person could subdue nine people in order to murder them one by one. It just didn't make sense. After they were able to talk to Cora, they realized there had only been one attacker in the house. But how had he been able to control all nine women? The man was described as a soft-spoken person who was polite at first and kept the women calm by continually telling them he wasn't going to hurt them. He told them he was just going to rob them. They wanted to believe him, so they complied. Cora told police that the man had a southern drawl, spoke slowly, and even smiled and said please when tying them up. She told them about the debate the Filipino nurses had with the American nurses. After he'd taken the first woman from the room, the Filipino girls believed that the six of them that were left at the time could fight off the solo attacker. At least, they thought, most of them might have a chance to escape. But the American girls believed that Speck would not hurt them, as he promised, and they didn't want to antagonize him into going back on his promise. He also kept them unaware of what was happening to their housemates. He took them one by one out of sight of the others, killed them quietly, and then washed up and even changed out of bloody clothing before retrieving the next girl. Not until Cora saw his attack on Gloria Davy did she know what Speck was capable of. Now the police knew they were looking for one man. Meanwhile, once the public heard about the horrific attack, they were shocked, frightened, and outraged. Cook County Coroner Andrew Toman, one of the first to observe the bloody scene and the brutal injuries sustained by the victims, called what had happened the crime of the century. The news media would report it as such. The public wanted answers. Who was the monster who had stolen into their community and committed such a vicious act? Richard Franklin Speck had only been in the Chicago area for about four months. He'd left Dallas, Texas, where he was suspected of several burglaries. He was staying with his sister, Martha Thornton, and her husband, Jean, who were unaware of the trouble he was in. Richard Speck can best be described as the bad egg of the Speck family. He was born December 6, 1941, to Benjamin and Mary Margaret Speck. The family was poor but hardworking and honest. Mary Margaret was a religious woman and raised her eight children to know right from wrong. Richard was the seventh of eight children. He and his younger sister Caroline were much younger than his two older brothers and four older sisters. His older siblings say that the two youngest children were spoiled the way the others had not been. Richard would only be close to his little sister Caroline. Most of his older siblings had married and begun their own families when he was still young. His father died at the age of 53 when Richard was only six years old. Richard's mother then met and fell in love with a man named Carl Lindbergh. Carl was the exact opposite of her first husband. The Specks were teetotalers. Mary had not allowed any alcohol in her home as a rule. But Carl was a hard-drinking hellraiser with a criminal record of forgery and drunken driving. He was prone to violence when he was drinking, and was especially harsh towards his new stepson, Richard. Mary moved with Richard and Caroline to Texas after marrying Lindbergh. While Richard Speck's siblings would all be hardworking and law-abiding citizens, Speck would take another path. He did poorly in school, and later it would be discovered that he had extremely poor vision. 
He was fitted for glasses but refused to wear them. He was a loner and didn't engage much in school. He had a paranoia at being stared at and refused to participate when required to give presentations in class. He began ninth grade in 1957, but at the end of his first semester, he'd earned no credits, even flunking physical education. He dropped out in January 1958 and never returned to school. Speck began drinking at the age of 12. While he hated his alcoholic stepfather, he began to emulate his behavior from a young age. By the age of 13, he had already begun his criminal career. He was arrested for setting a fire in retaliation when a used car lot owner wouldn't allow him to ride his bike on the property. By 1963, his mother had separated from her second husband, but by then Richard was running wild, drinking, doing drugs, and fighting. Before he turned 18, he'd racked up 41 arrests for disturbing the peace, drunk and disorderly conduct, and fighting in movie theaters and on the streets. He also began to break into homes, stealing in order to obtain drugs and booze. Speck would reach six foot one inches tall and had a muscular build and was very strong. He wore his dirty blonde hair slicked back and had blue eyes and had a sharp angular face. He might have been considered handsome if it weren't for his acne scarred pockmarked face and his habit of staring stupidly into space as if in a fog with his mouth hanging open. In 1961, Speck met 15-year-old Shirley Malone at the Texas State Fair. Within a few months, the high school freshman was pregnant. Speck's mother insisted he marry the pregnant teen, and in January 1962, they were married before the Justice of the Peace. They moved in with Speck's mother. Shirley gave birth to their daughter, Robbie Lynn, in July of that year. When his child was born, Speck was serving a jail sentence in McKinney, Texas, for disturbing the peace. He would spend almost half of their four-year marriage incarcerated. He would receive several tattoos in prison, including the phrase, Born to Raise Hell, on his forearm. This tattoo would help in his capture after the Chicago murders. Shirley's mother described her son-in-law as cruel, irresponsible, unstable, and violent towards her daughter. In contrast, she said Speck's mother was a wonderful person, one of the nicest people I've ever met. Mary Speck's big mistake would be bailing Richard out of trouble at every opportunity. She would make excuses for her son, saying that all of his troubles stemmed from running around with older boys who were a bad influence. She admitted he drank too much, but said he only got in trouble when he was drunk. When sober, he never got into any trouble, she explained. Richard would harass and beat his wife, and once even punched his young daughter in the stomach. He also made sexual advances towards his mother-in-law, and threatened her with a knife for harboring her daughter when she tried to flee her abusive marriage. Shirley divorced Speck in 1966 and soon married another man who adopted her daughter as his own. Speck would be incarcerated from 1963 to 1965 on a burglary charge and then released on parole. He was evaluated by the prison psychologists during his incarceration. In their report, Speck was described as dull and slow, likely to relapse, and should be kept in maximum security because of his emotional and social immaturity. His rating for rehabilitation was predicted as poor. Five days after his release, he attacked a woman in a parking lot, threatening her with a knife. She was able to get away, and he was arrested soon afterwards and charged with aggravated assault. He gave the excuse that he was drunk and didn't clearly remember the details of the crime. He did admit to trying to rob the woman because, quote, he couldn't find work but he was adamant that he hadn't been planning to rape the woman. He said he blacked out and only came to when he was in the county jail. If I hadn't been drinking, I wouldn't have done it, was the excuse he offered to the police. He was sentenced to 490 days in jail for the assault, but because of a clerical error, he was released 300 days early. Six months after his release, he got into an argument with another man and stabbed him several times. He was once again charged with aggravated assault, but his mother would hire an attorney, and the charge was reduced to disturbing the peace. He was fined $10, but because he refused to pay, what? He would spend three days in jail. A few weeks later, he robbed a market in Dallas of over 70 cartons of cigarettes that he then began selling from the trunk of his car. Police were alerted, and he abandoned the car that was soon traced back to him. A warrant was issued for his arrest on March 8, 1966. Speck decided to leave Texas, and it was at this time that he arrived in Chicago to stay with his sister and brother-in-law, the Thorntons. 
After a few weeks of housing Richard, who didn't seem in any hurry to find work and move out, the Thorntons drove him to the National Maritime Union Hall, the hiring center for merchant seamen. They hoped he would be hired to work on a ship that would sail soon. The hiring hall was only a few doors away from the nursing residences. He almost got hired, but another more senior man decided to take the position, edging Speck out for the job. His brother-in-law gave him $25 and left him to find lodging near the hall, where hopefully another position would open up soon. When he couldn't find an available room right away, Speck whiled away his time at the area bars. People remember seeing the tall man with the southern drawl, who liked to engage them in obviously embellished stories about his misdeeds in Texas. He told people he had to leave the state because a crime syndicate was after him. The other patrons just considered him another drunk loudmouth. He sported a Born to Raise Hal tattoo on one arm and wore a large hunting knife hanging in a sheath on his belt. He also liked to flash a three-inch switchblade knife. Speck preferred the company of hard drinkers like himself. He had no ambitions or goals other than scoring a few dollars for his next drink, drug purchase, or prostitute procurement. He was skilled at breaking and entering and was becoming more violent and intent on rape. One of the neighbor's tavern regulars was 53-year-old Ella May Hooper. Speck was a stranger to Ella May, and when he began to follow her as she left the bar, she was wary. He tried to talk to her and she ignored him. He then walked up close behind her and told her he had a knife in her back. Do what I tell you and I won't hurt you, he said. He must have said this 25 times, she later told an investigator. He then led her to a room he had rented in the low-budget shipyard inn. After making her drink with him and then interrogating her with bizarre questions like, did she like young men and would she ever want to live with a younger man, he forced her to take off her clothes and raped her. Afterwards, he let her leave, saying, if you ever tell this, I'll kill you and your kids if it takes me a hundred years. He threw her purse back to her before she left. Ella May hurried to her daughter's house. When she inspected her purse, she found that her gun, a 22 caliber black Rome pistol, was missing. Speck would take this gun with him the next evening to the nurse's residence. Police investigators swung into action immediately after the murders were discovered. They needed to find the perpetrator and fast. Corazon Amaral gave her a description of a white male, approximately 25 years old, six feet tall, short or crew-cut hair, no hat, wearing a black waist-length jacket and dark pants. She also said he spoke in a soft drawl and had blonde hair. After giving the initial description, Cora was put under heavy sedation as she continued to weep hysterically at times. Police believed the person they sought had to be from the area since most people were unaware of the nurse's residence. They began scouring the neighborhood to see if anyone remembered a man matching Cora's description. When they asked an attendant at a Shell gas station, he said he did remember a man who'd used the place the previous morning to wash up. He'd been complaining about a damn ship. From there, they decided to visit the National Maritime Union building. They also thought the perpetrator might be a sailor because the women had been bound with expertly tied double knots. They had been tied so tightly that some of the bindings could not be removed until they were cut off with scissors. The agent at the Union couldn't remember anyone matching that description. They tried another gas station, which also provided storage facilities for seamen and transients to leave bags when they couldn't secure a room to rent. At one gas station, they hit pay dirt. The attendant remembered a man who fit the description, who had tried to leave bags on the morning of July 12th, two days before the murders. He wasn't hired for a position on a ship, the attendant recalled, and was angry. He said he had a southern drawl, like a hillbilly. Not only that, but the attendant reached into the wastebasket and retrieved a slip of paper the man had tossed into it. It was a duplicate of the assignment slip the man had been given at the Union Hall. On it was listed the name Richard B. Speck. They began searching nearby rooming houses for someone registered under that name. After asking around about a Richard Speck, they were able to get a more accurate description of their suspect, including the memorable tattoo on his forearm which read, Born to Raise Hell. They also were able to obtain a photograph that had been taken of Speck when he was required to complete a Coast Guard application to be hired as a seaman. Crime lab technicians were also hard at work dusting for prints at the townhouse. They would find prints from the intruder on the inside of the front door, as well as on the bottom of one of the bedroom doors. 
1966, fingerprint work was a painstaking process, as prints had to be matched manually by comparing latent prints found at crime scenes with physical fingerprint records. By Saturday, however, working around the clock, a fingerprint expert would find 10 points of identification between Speck's Coast Guard fingerprint record and the print taken from the inside of the front door. The television news programs broke in to update their report on the murders. It was then that Speck learned he had left behind a survivor. He decided to leave the area quickly. He took a cab out of town, instructing the cab driver to take him to the north side of the city. Driving through a poor neighborhood, he asked the driver to stop. They were directly in front of the Cabrini Green housing complex. He got out of the cab and was immediately noticed. This was a predominantly African-American neighborhood, and a white man in the housing projects was an anomaly. Witnesses would later describe seeing him look around and walk one way and then another before turning down a side street. He soon came to a North Dearborn Street flop house, the Rally Hotel, and took a room under the name David Staten. He left the rally and went to a tavern for a few hours, wearing a jacket in the heat to hide his tattoos. He returned to his room late that afternoon with a prostitute. She left about 30 minutes later. On her way out, she spoke to the person at the registration desk. Speck had passed out drunk, and she said he seemed nice, but saw that he had a gun in his room. He told her his name was Richard. The hotel clerk called the police. They came to find him dead drunk, and they woke him and asked why he had a gun. He gave them a story, and they thought he seemed calm and harmless. He told them his real name, Richard Speck but they didn't make the connection to the wanted man and left. By 7 p.m., more than a dozen police detectives armed with copies of Speck's photo fanned out just blocks from the Rally Hotel. They narrowly missed him. He had left only 15 minutes before police arrived to search the hotel. When they showed the clerk the picture, she said, Oh my God, that's him. That's Richard. He just left. He took another room that night but was desperate to find a job that would take him away from the growing manhunt. Meanwhile, the police chief scheduled a conference to name the killer. Soon, the entire city of Chicago would be on the lookout for him. He knew time was running out, but he wasn't able to get out of town, and it was too late. By late that afternoon, his name and picture were plastered all over the evening newspapers. An all-points bulletin had been issued for Richard Speck. He was the most wanted man in America. He bought several newspapers and a pint of muscatel and took them back to his room at another flop house called the Star Hotel. He was now staying in a room registered to B. Bryan. He decided now his only way out was to commit suicide. He made a feeble attempt, breaking the muscatel bottle and using the jagged edge to cut the inside of his left elbow and his right wrist. It has to be asked, if he really wanted to die, why not use the knife he still carried? He lay on his cot with his arm hanging off the edge, bleeding onto the floor. Speck was sharing the room with another man named Lunsford. When he returned to his room, he found Speck lying on the cot covered in blood. When he asked what happened, Speck told him he had fallen into a window. Rather than calling for help, Lunsford said, See you later, and beat it out of there. He surely didn't want to get involved in whatever drama was playing out for this near-total stranger. Lunsford went around the corner to a coffee shop and sat down to read the paper. The first thing he saw was his bloody roommate's picture plastered on the front page. He went to the payphone and called the police. The man you're looking for is in room 584 of the Star Hotel with blood all over. The police dispatcher logged the call, but never sent out a patrol car. About midnight, another resident at the Star Hotel came upon the bleeding man who was staggering out of his room. A call was made about an injured man in room 584 of the Star Hotel. A police unit was finally dispatched. They were told the man's name was B. Bryan. He was taken by ambulance to the Cook County Hospital. The bodies of the eight slain nurses lay in the morgue at the same hospital when he arrived. The emergency room record read, Patient B. Bryan had been drinking and evidently fell on a broken bottle, causing lacerations of both arms. He had a weak pulse and very low blood pressure. The emergency room physician on duty was Dr. Leroy Smith, a young first-year resident. He had just returned from his dinner break, where he'd read the newspaper account of the manhunt for Richard Speck, as well as his description. He was called back in to see the injured patient listed as B. Bryan. 
Upon entering the emergency room, he thought the man looked familiar, but couldn't immediately place him. He began to assess his injured arm, wiping away the blood and uncovering the tattoo that read, Born to Raise Hell. Now he remembered reading the description of Speck's identifying tattoos. He retrieved the newspaper and held the picture up to the patient's face. Once he realized who he was, he squeezed him hard in the back of the neck. What's your name, he demanded. The patient squeaked out, Speck, Richard Speck. Then he asked for water. Did you give those nurses any water? He spat out at him. Within five minutes, over 50 police cars converged on the hospital. Richard Speck would never admit to the murders. He would say he had been high on drugs and drunk and didn't remember what had happened that night at all. Corazon Amara, however, would report that while she did smell alcohol in Speck's breath that night, there was no indication that he was anything other than calm and in control of all his faculties. He was methodical and in no way seemed impaired or high on drugs. She would bravely face the murderer of her friends in court. When asked to identify the man who had taken her hostage that night and raped and murdered the eight nurses, she would leave the witness box and walk to stand directly in front of Speck before pointing her finger at him and firmly stating, it was him. Cora's eyewitness testimony, as well as the fingerprint evidence and Speck's suicide attempt after he'd been identified as the killer, would all work to convict him. The jury reached a verdict after less than an hour of deliberation. He was found guilty of eight counts of murder, and the sentence for each was death by electric chair. His execution date was set for September 1, 1967. Speck's death sentence was automatically appealed and confirmed by the Illinois Supreme Court in 1968. However, in 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional, voiding Speck's death sentence. He was given a new sentence of eight consecutive sentences of not less than 50, nor more than 100 years for a total of 400 to 1,200 years in prison. Nineteen years later, Speck would die of a heart attack at the age of 49. He'd served more than half of his life for the crime. His body was unclaimed. His family did not want to bury him, fearing that his grave would be desecrated by his haters. Instead, he was cremated and his ashes were scattered in an undisclosed location. His brain, however, was retained by the Chicago Institute of Neurosurgery for study. They began to section his brain, and noticing something strange on the hippocampus, decided to send it to Harvard to be examined by the world expert on that area of the brain. The hippocampus is located close to the amygdala, which controls aspects of mood and aggression. They packaged up the brain, but the next day, when they went to retrieve it for shipment, it was gone. Someone had stolen or otherwise disposed of Speck's brain. Garbage cans all over the campus were searched, and a reward was offered, but it was never found. This should have been the end of the story of Richard Speck, but you know me so it's not. In 1988, a video was made in Statesville Prison, where Speck spent a quarter of a century. It had long been rumored that there was corruption and bribe-taking going on between guards and prisoners, and that the prisoners were running the show. This video will unequivocally confirm the rumor. The video was recorded by an unseen and unidentified man. Richard Speck, middle-aged and heavyset now, is seen on the tape as well as a younger black man identified as Ronzel Larimore. The videographer is interviewing Speck. Speck and Larimore admit to being lovers. Speck is bragging about his exploits in prison, including the ability to have all the sex and drugs he wants. He is also shown on camera snorting cocaine. But more shocking than that is when Speck disrobes on camera. Not only is he seen wearing women's silky underwear, but he also has breasts. He has obviously been taking female hormones to change his body. He talks about having sex with black gangbangers in prison. The consensus is that Speck, as cunning as ever, knew his notoriety would get him killed in prison, so he was using his Frankenstein-like quasi-female body to trade sex for protection. Most importantly, in the video, Speck confesses to the murders for the first and only known time. The interview asks, What are you locked up for? Speck answers, eight counts of murder. Did you kill them? He's then asked. Sure I did, he answers. Why? To which Speck answers, it just wasn't their night. (music) 
Like we've seen with many notorious cases, the perpetrator often becomes famous, or should I say infamous, while the victims are forgotten. This case is no exception. Richard Speck and his crimes have been detailed in film, television, and music for over 50 years. But the details about the young women he murdered have been lost. We've just passed the 50th anniversary of their untimely deaths, and I want to end this episode by reminding the listeners who these young women were. Nina Jo Schmally volunteered at an elder care facility after graduating from high school and loved working with the patients. This experience, along with the fact that her older brother John was studying to become a doctor, helped her decide to become a nurse. She was very close to her brother John, her only sibling. She loved Elvis, cats, and the color pink. Her prized possession was her car, a 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air convertible, a gift from her father. She was engaged to Peter McNamee, and they planned to marry after she graduated from nursing school. Her brother John and his wife established the Nina Jo Schmally Scholarship Fund at Wheaton College. Patricia Ann Matuzik was known as sweet, funny, and full of life by her family and friends. When she was 14 years old, she spent many afternoons visiting her 15-year-old cousin who was dying in the hospital. This experience made her decide that nursing was her calling. Her father owned a tavern and the family lived above it on South Michigan Avenue. She attended Catholic school and was on the pom-pom squad. She loved water ballet and always wore her hair in a perfect flip, the popular hairstyle of the time. Her family buried her wearing the outfit she would have worn for her upcoming graduation, her nursing uniform and cap. Her hair was styled into a perfect flip. Pamela Lee Wilkening was known as the most studious and serious of the girls. She grew up in Lansing, Michigan, and had an older brother named Jack. She had been a Girl Scout and liked to attend all the basketball and football games at her high school with her friends. She worked part-time in a bakery after school and was in the nursing club. Her brother told her that her diligence and steady temperament would make her a good military nurse. She loved to watch her brother Jack race cars. The last time Jack saw his sister was at one of his races a week before she died. Jack says that he still thinks of his sister every day and wishes his children could have known their Aunt Pam. Mary Ann Jordan's grandmother had been a high-ranking surgical nurse in the early 1900s. She was the inspiration for Mary Ann to become a nurse. Mary Ann was the fourth of six children. Her brother Billy, her youngest sibling, was born with Down syndrome. Mary Ann had a special bond with Billy, and he was the reason she wanted to specialize in pediatric nursing. She enjoyed physical activities, including swimming, ice skating, softball, and roller skating. Her classmate and friend, Suzanne Ferris, was engaged to Mary Ann's brother, Phil. Mary Ann had visited the townhouse that night to talk about wedding plans with her soon-to-be sister-in-law. Suzanne Bridget Ferris was one of three children growing up with her older sister, Marilyn, and her younger brother, John. John remembers his sister teaching him how to make grilled cheese sandwiches and play solitaire. Her father's nickname for her was Cookie. She was pretty and popular and good with people, which made her a good nurse, her brother says. Her fiancé, Phil, taught public school. Suzanne's family didn't have much money, so she made some of her own clothes. She worked her way through nursing school. She was excited about her upcoming wedding, but was waiting until after she graduated since nursing students couldn't be married at that time. Her fiancé lost his intended bride and his sister in the same night. Valentina Passion arrived in Chicago from the Philippines in May of 1966. She was called Tina by her family. She had graduated the year before among the top 10 nursing students at Manila Central University. Like many of the exchange students, she sent most of her money she made in America back home to her parents and five siblings. Valentina was a good cook and liked to whip up Filipino specialties to share with her housemates. Merlita Gargullo was the first person from her village in the Philippines to travel to America. She was the oldest of nine children. Merlita was quiet, shy, pretty, and had a beautiful singing voice. 
She wrote many letters home and was writing one the night she died about her recent trip to Wisconsin. Over 100 people waited in the rain to pay their respects when her casket arrived home to the Philippines. Gloria Jean Davy was the second of six siblings of five girls and one boy. Her sister Lori describes her as driven, independent, intelligent, headstrong, poised, and creative. She switched her major from English to nursing at North Illinois University. She became president of the Student Nurses Association of Illinois. Her 11-year-old sister Lori went up to receive her big sister's diploma from nursing school. When she grew up and became a mom, Lori couldn't bear to tell her own children the truth of what happened to her sister, so she told them that their aunt had died in a car crash. It wasn't until her daughter was in high school and saw her grandfather on a program about the murders did Lori then tell them the truth. Cora Amaral Atienza, the only survivor, is now 61 years old, the mother of two and grandmother of six. She married Bert Atenzia, an attorney, in 1969. She went home to the Philippines after the trial, but returned to the U.S. after her marriage. She worked as a critical care nurse at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., before retiring. The couple settled in Woodbridge, Virginia, and Bert now practices immigration law. They now have more than 100 relatives living in the U.S. Cora remembers the friends she lost fondly, and tries to focus her memories on the good times, like when they shared a meal together around the big kitchen table at 2319 East 100th Street. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Follow the show on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>